What up, what up, what up? Welcome back to Sam Donks, the weekly NBA show over here at Slab Stocks. I'm your host, Sam. It is Monday, January 18th. Last Thursday, I recorded an interview with Amit Taylor, the video coordinator over at Clemson University. A really fun interview. We didn't get into a whole ton of card talk, but there's a ton of basketball talk, ton of NBA talk. I uh, hope you enjoy it. It's a little bit longer, but uh, really, really good stuff. Uh, Amit was a great interview, a ton of fun for me. Uh, toward the end, I got kind of an uh, emergency phone call that I had to take, and we had to cut the interview a little bit short. We were getting into the Brooklyn Nets talk at that moment. Uh, I had a little a couple spicy takes I was going to be throwing out there and didn't get to go into those because of that, but uh, we'll get more into the Brooklyn Nets in future interviews. So I uh, hope you enjoy. Uh, going to go find Carol Baskin. I'm here at the Tampa Zoo. Uh, enjoy your day. All right, I'm being joined here by Amit Taylor. Amit's a video coordinator at Clemson University for the men's basketball team. Uh, Amit, could you tell us a little bit about your job? You know, what do you do as a as a video coordinator? Yeah, well, you know, Sam. First of all, uh, let me let me let me flash this paw here real real quick. Uh, <laughs> I know it didn't go so well for football, but basketball is good this year. And you know, for people who follow college basketball, hopefully, you guys know we're, we're having a good season, especially by uh, basketball standards in the ACC. Yeah, because um, this is you know the toughest league in the in the country, and you know I say that completely unbiased. Big Ten, but Big Ten's doing great. great do uh, you know Big Ten's doing great? Big Twelve's doing great, but yeah. you know ACC is basketball ACC. country. Yeah. Um, but you know my my job as video coordinator means like anything the coaches need from video. So they want to watch games. They want to watch particular instances or sequences of basketball things that happen. So they want to see like every time a pick and roll happens on the right side of the floor. Ball gets thrown back to another side, thrown down to the corner, and the guy shoots in a three. They want to. They want to know what the answers to questions like that are. So, are you looking at like uh, like trends for how guys play? It's not so much like looking at sets and and uh, you know plays or anything like that. But is it more like you know individual players' trends or you know how do you how do you analyze all that? So, obviously, basketball is a very personnel driven game, okay. but there's also structure within what teams do. So we look at personnel tendencies for sure that's actually the, you know when we introduce a new team to our players and our coaches one of the first things we introduce is personnel who they are how they play what they're good at what are their weaknesses and then the other thing we look at is the structure of their team so what do they do are they a heavy ball screen team are they motion are they you know do they play primarily zone defense which you know we Syracuse just joined our league a few years ago all two three zone some teams change how they play year to year. So a couple years ago, Duke couldn't defend a parked car like Brad Beal said just recently. So they yeah. played all 2-3 zone for the second half of the year. And and I think it ended up working out for them pretty well. Um, so, you know, you study a little bit of everything. And, you you know, our, our staff is the kind of staff that leaves no stone unturned, like no questions that are unasked. They want the answers to everything. So we watch a we, – we watch a lot of video uh, across, you know, three assistant coaches, a head coach, myself – and you know and two or three other full-time people so when i was in uh high school small wisconsin high school one year varsity no big deal uh if we had a, if we had a game coming up against a team i would just find out the kid's number that i was going to be guarding and i would just spend the uh like the layup lines you know watch him it's like right. sizing them up a little bit uh obviously you spend more time than that doing your uh your analysis before in prep for a game, how much, you know, how much time goes into a game just on, on your, you know, your role as, on, with the team, how much time do you put in, in preparation? Cause I mean, in NBA, there's 30 teams and you, you, you know, a lot of the players already, you know, a lot of their habits, so much of that's well, much, much more publicized, but I imagine college, it's probably a little tougher. Definitely at the beginning of the season, right? You got all these incoming freshmen, you got transfers who didn't play the previous year. So then you're looking at old film, you're trying to find high school film and see what yeah. is this guy's game like. Wow. You know, yeah, like like I like I said, our staff leaves no stone unturned. So we're the kind of people who will like dig deep on YouTube, we'll dig deep in like the, you know, whatever archives we can find to 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 get an answer to questions that are asked. Hmm. Whether it's like you know, go find all the threes so and so made, or go find all the restricted area shots so and so made, or every time this guy played defense in this particular coverage, 
like it's so you know time wise it, it really just depends and it depends whether you're in season out of season uh out of season you're obviously focusing more on yourself but in season it also depends on the turnaround time between games and you know 99 percent of the season we've got at least two days between games yeah um you know come tournament time you're turning out all the stuff around on on you know a day or two and you know luckily you've got your assistant coaches and your other staff who kind of pull together and and uh try to knock out preliminary reports and preliminary studies um and information gathering on on a on a upcoming opponent you're working in you're working in basketball like that sounds awesome also sounds exhausting uh, on the basis of everything you're saying, I'm sure there's, you know, it's rewarding to be able to sit there and watch film and, you know, break it down and defeat your opponents on the basis of, you know, the type of work that you were able to put in behind the scenes. You know, that's got to be satisfying, but also pretty tiring, I bet. Uh, you've been in basketball for, I think you got your start kind of 2012. Did I, is that yeah, it sounds about right. Yeah, it feels longer than that, but it, I think that sounds right. So how did you uh, how did you come up? How did you get to the video coordinator position at Clemson? Uh, you're you're gonna love this one. So uh, you know I had no ties to basketball. I was I'm, you know former engineer worked at U.S. Department of Energy, um, X-ray science division. Just a big basketball nerd, and uh, you know threw myself out there one summer. Went to summer league just on a whim, and happened to fly back on the same flight as the entire Bulls organization did, <laughs> and. <laughs> To further my luck, I sat behind some pretty high-level decision makers in the organization on yeah. my flight back. So, you know, they pointed me in the direction of who was hiring and who was, you know, in charge of certain departments of their of their basketball operations side. So, you know, granted, it was a red red eye flight. Uh, so I tried to be respectful of that, but I really wanted, you know, to 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 be a part of something there. So I bugged somebody, and I waited for them to get off the plane, walk with them out of the airport. And I was about to go take an unpaid division three job in California when I got a call from them and said, there, here, here's this part-time position open. Uh, it doesn't pay a whole lot, but if you're interested, give us a call. Wow. So what were you doing for the Bulls? So before all the tracking data and, and all that advanced stats became a thing, this was like the preliminary charted by hand, you know, put these hand-drawn diagrams and hand-drawn tables and all that stuff. Really, really basic elementary like like uh, statistics reports for every every game. So post-game reports were at the time before, you know, the optical tracking companies took over the the advanced tracking data. Um, these were these were all done by hand and they were done by like a group of six or seven people like me who were all responsible for one particular thing and it could rotate on any any night. So sometimes it was play by play. Sometimes it was tra uh, shot charts. Sometimes it was, you know, defensive rebounding sometimes, you know, and there was a whole, like coach Tom Thibodeau is a big stats head. Don't, don't, uh, don't let his uh, nature or his uh, anything like that fool you, but he's, he's big on being data driven. So there, Dude, were this report, there were reports about maybe this thick on his desk after every game with just like stats for post game stats reports. Are you the guy that told him, were you writing stats out and saying, you know, you should play your players 42 minutes and, and <laughs> big believer in the load management right here. Yeah. Big believer in that stuff. That, that's a, those are some good, uh, good bulls teams that you got to be in and yeah. around right there. At yeah, the beginning definitely. Too. definitely. You know, it was, it, the, the, the year I worked there was the year Derek Rose was hurt the whole year. So we <sighs> kind of, and, and, you know, toward the end of that year, everybody was getting hurt and you know, there were, we were, we were, you know, Jimmy Butler got thrown into the fire that year. Nate yeah. Robinson saved the day in game one against Miami that year. You know, Marco Bellinelli went crazy in game seven against the Nets. We just had some unbelievable things happen that year. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good. So good team to get a start on. You You next went to the the Knicks. Did you spend some time with the Knicks? I spent some time doing some scouting work for for a, for, for a, one of their front office people. So he just gave – he would hand out some assignments to us that we got to, we got to know him through going out to summer league and just kind of, you know, shooting the breeze with him and uh, kept in touch. And he said, Hey, I got this guy. I want you to study. Oh, wow. So it became something like go on, go on the, the video databases and just study the guy. What's he good at? What's he not good at? Should I go watch? Should I go spend my money to go watch this guy play? And sure enough, he did. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what happened to the guy ever since then. He must've fallen off the face of the earth or something because he never made it to the league. And I don't know how much, professional basketball that got the guy played but he had a chance he was a big big guy out of the university of hawaii oh well, yeah not too many basketball players coming out of there that you usually hear it's crazy how much uh how far we've come in 
you know, just eight years. I graduated high school in 2010, so it's like doesn't feel that far away for me. But 2012, it's like in eight years we've gone from you hand jamming in, you know, shot locations and shot types, and you know, I'm sure like closest defender and all that. And now it's like, you know, the second it's done, you have the play by play on, right. on whatever whatever application you want to have on your phone. You have it all there. You you find all the all the breakdown of all the shots and everything uh, afterwards. It's uh, it's wild that we have all that now, just this short time later, which makes, you know, your job probably a lot easier, makes Definitely. things that I do for slab stocks quite a bit easier too. Definitely. No, as a coach, that's like one of the things like that, you know, one of the things coaches are big on is like how many times a ball hits the paint. They want to know, like they, they, there's this belief among coaches that possessions where the ball hits the paint and then gets sprayed out usually ends up in better, you know, shooting percentages, definitely shot qualities. And that's a huge, huge belief among coaches. Like I think almost universally. Wait, and could you repeat that? Ball hits the paint? Ball, ball hits the paint. So we call them paint touches, right? So ball hits the paint, like whether it's on like an offensive rebound or drive or, you know, you know, however it gets there, it gets there. And there's a universal belief among coaches that shot quality and shot, shooting percentages are higher when the ball reaches the paint, which is why, you know, you use you, if you listen to coaches after after a game, you'll say, we let the ball into the paint too much. We let the ball into the middle too much. Right. Uh, yeah, no no middle is a is a big coaching term. Well, you know, it's really intuitive because it's like the, cl- the best sh- – <laughs> it drives me nuts when someone passes up a an open layup and kicks it out, and then you have these dudes on ESPN they are like, that's the analytics, that's the analytics, blame the analytics. You pass – no, the analytics says take that open layup because that's – that's the best shot right there. You know, the I'm a, I'm a big Milwaukee Bucks fan, and uh, their their defense, even though they it becomes flawed when they can only play one one method of defense, but their defense is is not built on stopping the three. It's built on stopping drives to the paint. You right. know, they have the zone drop system with right. uh, I mean, Brooke Lopez dropping in, and yeah, I, I mean, I that's just makes so much sense. You don't let the ball in the paint, and you know, dudes are hitting at sixty percent at the hoop. So, yeah, it's, it's incredible. So like, you know, obviously Milwaukee is a great example, but you know, like getting back to it, you know, before, before all the advanced tracking data, you'd have to count that stuff by hand. So you'd have to watch every single clip or every single moment of the game right? to count manually how many times the ball hit the paint. Now, you know, within a click, you're, you've got it. You've got the answer. So yeah, the technology has come very far to make our jobs easier as coaches and as, you know, I'm sure it's easy on front offices when they're trying to compare players to each other, or compare teams to each other. They can say, okay, here's what they're really good at. And here's all, you know, here's all this readily quantifiable data that was, you know, either really time consuming to get before, or you just couldn't quantify it. Right. Well, I'm glad now that, that your old position is defunct. You still <laughs> have a position that you didn't get, you know, let out with the, you know, the, or the tracking data came in. So you went from, you went from the NBA. That's when you took the jump into college then, yeah. 2013. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So, um, you know, with Joe Kim Noah being uh, on the Bulls, there were some really big Florida ties there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the the people recommended that I go work a bunch of summer camps. And sure enough, I reached out to the people of Florida who were really receptive to it. They, you know, had me work their summer camp. And at the end of the uh, summer camp, which was about a week long, you know, the person who ended up hiring me, um, told me, you know, hey, we, we have a position. We, it doesn't pay really anything, but it's yours if you want. And I said, sign me up. I don't even have to, I don't even have to think twice. Sign me up. So, that, you know, basketball, PhD, whatever you want to call it, started right there. I think, Sweet. you know, more, you know, it's one thing to, to work on the, more on an analytics side, but actually being around the coaches more and being around the, the, the day-to-day where you can see practice every single day and be a part of practice every single day and break down, you know, all the good and bad from practice every day is, is a lot more educational Yeah, uh, when you're trying to learn the game. Yeah. Just hearing, and, hearing the coaches talk and talking. Yeah. About it yeah. Time. And, and, you know, you're, you're, you're a part of it. You're in there, you know, you're like you're in, you're in on the meetings. You, you kind of know what's going into every day of practice, whether you're, whether it's day one of practice or whether it's, you know, you're preparing for, you know, your first conference game or something, you know? Yep. Um, so I'm connecting the dots here a little bit. I don't know if you've made these connections before, but you got your first job in Chicago, hometown. Then you went to Florida, Billy Donovan. 
You know where Billy Donovan coaches now, don't you? I do. I sure do. Yeah, Bill, you know, Coach Donovan and I are still in touch, and you know, we're trying to get trying my man to work, meet a job. We're, 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 we're trying to work some things out here. Nice. <laughs> I'll be really hoping to hoping to see you on an NBA sideline someday. Oh, one, one day. Well, that's that, you know, ultimately that's that's the goal. I'd love to be an NBA coach, whether it's an assistant, head coach, you know, whatever, wherever I can fit myself in is, is where I'll go. It's you know. You probably heard this. I don't know. Maybe you haven't heard it. I don't know. But it's it's incredibly hard, especially right now with all the COVID protocols. They've actually shedded staff. So scouting yeah. staffs aren't even on the road to see games because a lot of places aren't allow allowing fans. So staff sizes are shrinking. But, but you know, until recently, staff sizes had been expanding. So, um, yeah. you know, we're, we're, there, there, there are some things in the works. Good. Well, I'll be hoping for the best for that. I'll be, you, connect uh, the, you connect the dots very well. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't take it, it wasn't too many leaps to to make that realization for me but so you know you just touched on something i know you know and every sport is kind of this way right now scouts aren't really going out on the road because i mean it's it's hard enough to get the players from a to b without you contracting anything no so it's the lower down it's, it's it's a it's a process just tell you know I don't mean to interrupt you, but it is a no, like going traveling to play a game, whether you're hosting somebody or you're going somewhere is a process. And, you know, having multiple people. So I'm, you know, hearing more and more all the things that have happened in the ACC alone in the past week or two. Like, you know, right now, Georgia Tech is on pause or, you know, yeah. we just had a short pause. And, you know, some friends over at NC State just told me they have a pause now. So it's like, you know. There's there, you know, the the, the loopholes you got to ju jump through just to get a game to happen is is crazy yeah so is it uh how with with all the analytics we have at our disposal today and with the video as readily available as it is today is it is it a bad thing for the scouts to not be there present in the gym you know is can they do the job just like as good sitting on their couch at home or you know a, a scout will tell you no I, and and I, I, I genuinely believe that that's probably the right answer. Uh, yeah. There are things you just can't see on the TV. Right. Uh, like when you're watching at home. Yeah. Like how does a person interact with their team? How does a, a person react to a bad call? How does a person react to, you know, coming out of the game when he doesn't feel like he should come out of the game? Yeah. You can't see that all the time on TV. Sometimes you can. Sometimes the cameras catch the interactions. But a lot of times they don't. Did his or, teammates go to his birthday party? <laughs> In you see that in COVID, COVID, movie on the Browns. That in COVID, in COVID times, that would be on. That would not be recommended. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, so there there are things you just can't see. Like you know, is a guy early to warm up? Is a guy early to stretch? Is a guy you know really yeah. serious about his body maintenance and all that stuff? Like these, you know, what kind of person is somebody? What kind of like seriousness does somebody have about themselves? These are things you don't always get to see from home. Right. So that's part of why, you know, I mean, NBA scouts do a whole lot of digging intel. They, they call anyone and everyone associated with a prospect from the time, like they start doing their intel. Like people were calling me about Cade Cunningham. I had never been around Cade Cunningham, right. but I knew people who were around Cade Cunningham. So they were calling me saying like, Hey, can you put me in touch with somebody who knows Cade Cunningham? <laughs> Is he the or, number one pick? It's a good question. We don't know yet. We'll see. When I watch cool. him play, it's like it's not like he's like overly explosive or anything like that. You know, you don't it doesn't doesn't seem like you watch him and you're like wowed, but everything he does is like good and he just gets to his spots and he puts up good shots. Is very talented player. Yeah. You know, uh, I haven't been able to watch a whole lot of Oklahoma State this year. I know they have a good team. I I, I really believe they have a good team. Um, I don't, you know. I haven't been able to watch them a ton just because we're, you know, kind of wrapped up in our own league right now. But, you know, our league produces a bunch of players too. Like my first year here, I think we played a Duke team that had Harry Giles, Jason Tatum, Luke Kennard, Frank Jackson, like four dudes who got drafted. Yep. Um, you know, Donovan Mitchell wrecked havoc on us. Like there's a the half joking when I said this, I said if you score 25 points on Clemson against our defense, you're probably a lottery pick. Yep. And sure enough, you know, Jason Tatum, Donovan Mitchell. The following year, Jerome Robinson, lottery picks. If you go on basketball reference and go to those games from, from those couple of years, those guys had, had did a number on us. And, and we, we half jokingly say, so, you know, so-and-so got drafted because of how they played against us. Yep. Hmm. Um, 
but you know, you know, this, this every year you're going to get some some great players. You're going to get uh, you know some guys who who you don't know a whole lot about, like a Lamelo Ball who goes overseas. You don't get to see a whole lot of. Um, which, by the way, I've been really impressed with him. Like I, I wasn't sure what to expect out of out of somebody who oh, yeah. is a little bit young and hasn't played against you know NBA level talent. But very impressive. Now, I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this, but is there something strange going on with college basketball right now where, like, I just think of last year's draft when the top, you know, some of the top guys available, you had LaMelo Ball who played uh, overseas, you know, hardly didn't even finish high school over here. So we barely got to see him at all. Played like half a dozen games last year. You have James Wiseman, who played three games or whatever it was at Memphis. Barely even got to see the guy. You had Anthony Edwards, who, like, I don't think he was really involved or, you know, in high school, was really brought to some of these, you know, summits or McDonald's, whatever, you know, or the Nike Hoop Summit or anything like that. He just kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, At least from my perspective, he did. Um, Obi Toppin, who's like, fifth year Dayton dude is right. like what's going you know we have guys that are playing one two three years at college and teams are going for the guys they know nothing about instead like what's it's, going it's, on so so my understanding is there's a huge value in youth now right if you think about it from an NBA team's perspective it's probably like a Here's a 19-year-old with no previous injury history, less miles on his knees or legs or whatever. Um, you know, in in my in my opinion, I think that's how that's how it's thought of. Like younger, maybe a higher ceiling because they're younger, right? And then less wear and tear on the body. Hmm. So, like you look at a uh, taking Obi Toppin, obviously very good player, versus a Lamelo Ball, played professionally one year versus played you know how many years of college, right? You know, more. This many games versus you know two years worth of games for Obi, right, or right. three years or whatever, whatever it ended up being. Um, you know, youth is very valuable. Youth is very favorably looked upon. Let me put it that way. But what you what I what I find out, especially in college, is like the older guys are the ones who win you games. Oh yeah. Well, every experience year, is is undervalued in my opinion. Every year, there's guys drop into the back of the first like second round. You know, like think of like a Malcolm Brogdon type of dude right. who just knew what to do, you know, doesn't, you know, he played four, I think he played four years at Virginia, good defender, long, he wasn't super athletic or anything like that, but knew where he needed to be, good team leader, he's, he was a team leader for Virginia, and then he comes in the NBA, and it's like, oh, wow, where'd this guy come from? Like, right. He's been doing it all along. And, but, so, and, you know, it's crazy, so much of it is situational, right? You can go to a situation where it's not good, and, you know, you don't get better, or you go to a situation like, where you're Kawhi Leonard and you get with a super shooting coach that San Antonio has and you work and work and work until your shot becomes, you know, a whole lot better. Right. Yeah. And suddenly you're a complete menace and you yeah. bring everything else you already had on the table. And now you can, now you're better at something that you weren't good at previously. Yeah. Like a lot of it is very situational, like where you go, how you, how you, and who you're around. Do you know Markel Fultz? I do. You're like close with him. We were we were together at many USA events. Okay, so yeah. I mean, pretty good example of what you're just saying. Like, I mean, I don't I don't presume to know him or at, at all, or you know the things that were going on. Obviously, there's just stuff going on. You don't need to get into that, but it's like he seen. I'm in Central Florida, so the closest NBA team to me is the Orlando Magic. And sure. going from Philadelphia, first overall pick, with and my my dad's side of the family is all from Philadelphia, so I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm in tune with Philly sports fans. And if you don't please right away, it can be pretty brutal. And you know, I kind of love Philly fans for that, but uh, you know, it doesn't seem like that was the greatest fit for Markel Fultz at that moment. It comes down to Orlando, where it's like there's not a whole ton of basketball fans around, I'd say, and uh, you know. Shot hasn't necessarily come around like like we hoped it would as he was coming out of college, but a lot of other parts of his games are really rounding out nicely. And of course, obviously now with him, you know, going down with the knees, uh, you know, disappointing. But uh, you know, seeing him get into a good spot while he still has you know some potential, 
you know, that's, you know, that's always encouraging. It doesn't, that doesn't happen for a lot of players, but uh, I'm really happy it happened for him because. No question. He's a, he's an unbelievable person, a great human being. Um, couldn't be happy for him. Now, obviously the injury sucks. It's, you know, but he's a, he's a mentally tough kid who will hopefully come back stronger from all this. He's, you know, seeing the kid since he was 17, yeah. being around him at some of the, you know, under 18, under 19, whatever it was and hoop summit and things like that. You could tell this kid's got, you know, something that you don't see in a lot of people. So a lot of players for sure. Yeah. Um, and you were starting to see, I think he was starting to scratch the surface of, of what we saw a few years ago as he was, you know, as the season was rolling out and, you know, a little bit last year too, after, and when he got comfortable playing there yep. and, you know, sky's the limit for him. Yep. Look forward to whenever he's back on the court. Oh yeah. Oh, a lot of those are Orlando, Jonathan Isaac and him. And yeah, it, I think Chumo Kiki just came back finally, and it's just like they just got to get healthy. Yeah, well, it, 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 you know that's that, that underscores a lot of stuff. Like fans want to, fans want to say the team's doing poorly, but like you know injuries happen, COVID happens, yeah. you know yeah. things things happen, and, and stuff you can't always control for. Yep. Um, but go, you know, going back to your other question, video analytics, um, you know, I think they complement each other a lot, a lot more than we realize, and things like having the tracking data makes it you know, almost seamless to, to figure out, you know, what's real and what's not. Right. Yeah. Because so many of the, you know, I go, I use NBA.com backslash stats, you know, all the time. And so many of those stats are just taken straight out of the video. So it's like, right. you know, the, you know, the, the, uh, there's always like the the nerds that look at the stats and then there's the guys that know how to play the game and they're watching the video. And it's like in the NBA, it's about as seamless as any sport out there where video and stats, they are pretty much one and the same. Um, you know, bear, but, with, you know, bear with me. I, I, should I put my Instagram name up here or something instead? Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, whatever you want to do. Yeah, let's do that. That way people can know where to find me or something. Sure. <laughs> there we go. Donut have a problem. That's me. A lot of donuts yeah. on there. By the way, you met Michael Jordan. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, flight school way back in 97, I want to say. Back in the day. That was good times. If you go to go to uh, Amit's uh, Instagram, I think it was like the third post. It was, it was you know what? My, my wife actually uh, was, was the one behind all that. She was like, you have to put, it was the day. So we posted it the day. And for the longest time, she ran my Instagram account because I was like, I don't really care to do this. You do, you yeah. do it for me. Now I kind of do a little bit myself. But she, it was the day the last dance was coming out in May or whatever it was uh, yeah. last year, and she said, "Oh, you have to post this video on the on, on the day the last dance comes out." So, so we did it. <laughs> I love it. But yeah, that was, was that was a moment at flight school all the way back in '97 when uh, you know Jordan at the end of I think it was at the end of the day every day for a week he would call up a random camper and. Uh, you know, just kind of shoot with him and stuff. And if you beat him in a game of horse or around the world or whatever it was, he would give you a pair of his shoes or two pairs of his shoes or something like that. So needless to say, I didn't finish the game, but I ended up with a couple pairs of Jordans. Wow. Nice. Congratulations. Very oh. cool. That, that's a surreal, surreal moment. I saw the video and I was like, is this him? And I was like scrolling through the comments. I think it was your wife who said something about you needing a haircut or whatever. And I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. Was like, oh, okay. That was him. Yep. Back in those days, which might have been before your time, dumb and dumber haircuts were the, were the thing. <laughs> yeah. so everybody was wearing jorts and having their hair down to here. Yeah, yeah. And, and the good old mid part. Hey, it was a good look back then. So you are uh, you're big into card collecting. I am. Wait, wait, I don't know if, I, if you want to finish the story. Let's let's. Oh let's yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, let's let's go. So two years at Florida, we go to a final yeah. four. Yeah. Uh, spend time two years there as the assistant video guy, which was really yeah. like PhD in basketball. Right, you're learning from. A brilliant, brilliant coaching staff with not only just Coach Donovan, but all the assistants that we have who are, you know, I think mostly head coaches now uh, elsewhere. Yeah. And, you know, um, from there, some opportunities arose where Coach Donovan was, you know, the head coach of the under-18 uh, under national team at, at Team USA. Yep. So, you know, I was a little, you know, talking to Coach Donovan for that first year was like the most nerve-wracking thing ever. But he's like the most personable human being you'll ever come across. Yeah. So at the end of the year, I went to him after the season was over and said, hey, coach, you know, uh, I'd really love to be a part of USA Basketball somehow. And he said, oh, you do? And I said, yeah, I mean, I, can I go with you guys? And he said, 
Yeah, we'll make that happen. <laughs> so uh, you do? Yeah. You, you want us to be around the best players in the world? Uh, yeah. So, so, so that was my first foray into like the high school, a little bit of the high school scene because I started with under 18s. And that year, the under 18s were like Luke Kennard, Justice Winslow, Miles Turner, all when they're like 16, 17 years old, come up through the high school circuits. Yeah. They get, you know, there's a, a camp full of, you know, 50 something kids that are, you know, these are the top high school players in the country. So Jalen Brown was there. Yeah. Jalen Brown was the first kids I met. Like I get to my, I get shown to my, my room. We're, we're staying at the USOTC in Colorado Springs. And, you know, our host shows us to our dorm. We're staying, you know, it's, it's like a typical college dorm looking thing, right? Yep. Get shown to your room across the hall is Jalen Brown. Like, <laughs> and I had no idea who this cat was at the time. He Neither did Boston out. fans when he was drafted. But, and, and, you know, I, I wasn't that in tune with the high school scene either. But, you know, he, he, he you know, not knocking the road. Let's check on Jalen. Jalen who? Jalen Brown. You don't know him? Uh, not really. <laughs> sure enough, Jalen Brown comes across. You know, we knock on the door. There he is. He had just come back from Adidas Euro Camp, which was a thing at the time. And he was jet lagged, so he was still wide awake. So we were, you know, shooting the breeze with Jalen Brown for an hour or something at like midnight. Wow. Um, and then, you know, the next day, more kids, are, you know, so, so doing a few years of that graduate, graduated me up to the senior men's team. So 2016 Olympics comes around. We're in training camp at uh, UNLV for the, yeah. for the 16 Olympics that happened in Brazil. And, uh, the, you know, that was a team with like Clay, Steph, or maybe not Steph, Clay, Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant, you know, all these other cats. And, you know, you're there and all their coaches are there and a lot of their front office people are there. And, uh, you know, DeAndre Jordan, we got into a routine for a week where we'd shoot free throws with him or, we, you know, we just kind of make sure he should be like his coaches would be like, hey, you got to make sure he shoots his free throws at the end of every practice. <laughs> so I didn't realize Doc Rivers was sitting six feet away or whatever it was. And I said, hey, DJ, did you shoot your free throws today? And Doc Rivers looks at me and says, expletive. Yeah, he shot his free throws today. <laughs> and I look over. I'm like, whoa, that's basketball royalty talking to you right there. Yeah. So, you know, U.S. So, you know, graduate, you know, and then that became a thing of the working hoop summit and, uh, you know, just, you know, working around those events and in a very similar role, you know, we built up an analytics uh, database with, with the USA people. We kind of revamped their video ops and, and uh, you know, made it really easily accessible for all the people that are well, actually a lot of those people that I work with aren't there anymore. They're now working with NBA organizations. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's cool to see like, you know, um, you be the start of a process and now it's, it's a thing. That's cool. Yeah. Were you involved at the 2020? No, you know what? I've ever since I've been here, it's kind of been locked into what we do here and sticking around here. So well, that's why our 2020 team was pretty wretched. It was, it was hard to get convinced guys after long seasons to play, you know, a, yeah. a qualifying tournament when it wasn't the actual Olympics. Now I, I have a feeling the Olympics will come around and it'll be, look a little bit different. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't know. So many guys that I'm sure they all have like little cleanup surgeries to do, you know, knees and ankles. It, it's hard, man. Like even, even a 30, we play a max of like 30 to 40 games. And even these seasons, you, the, the bumps and, and nicks and bruises you get through that are, are, are real, right? Like we had, we've had people get season ending surgeries here and come back in time to be ready for the next season, but then they don't do a whole lot for the summer. Right. So, you know, those are real things. But, you know, I expect that, you know, these guys are in really good hands. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of good players coming up through the pipelines now and that, that have a chance to, to be a part of it and they'll, they'll represent us the right way. Yep. Um, so, you know, through Billy Donovan came the USA stuff, which, which is kind of cool. Um, definitely Very a lot cool. of neat, definitely not a, a lot of neat experiences. Uh, just, you know, my first year at Florida, we went to a Final Four and we had this little, I don't even know what you call it, but. We had these little custom uh, cards made nice. back in the day. So here you go. One day. Are those a uh, pop? Is that a pop two card right there? It is a pop two card. Wow. <laughs> PSA 10. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, you, you, you sign know. it, go get it verified at PSA. Exactly. exactly. And it'll, I'll get it back in a year or something. <laughs> uh, no. So, so you know, uh, from there I went on and spent a year in, at Santa Clara University where Steve Nash once played and, and uh, spent a year there as a graduate assistant and, you know, kind of built up the video ops thing there too. And, and, you know, kind of got a chance to see, you know, being in the Bay area, got to see the Warriors practice twice that year in, in their pr training camp. And, you know, even go to, so one of the assistant coaches I worked with was first cousins of Steph Curry and uh, you know, still in touch with actually just got off the phone with him an hour ago, but 
um, you know, still in touch with that that coach today. And you know, we just crossed paths a few few weeks ago when we played his team. So uh, you know, the connections you build through this are pretty awesome. Like you never know who's who knows who. Yeah, very small world, and you know what, what you'll come to learn is everybody knows everybody. Well, now I'm only three degrees of separation away from Steph Curry. So hey, there you go. And then you know, after Santa Clara, uh, we spent a year there, and then uh, got 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 a chance to come here at Clemson. And you know, Clemson is definitely definitely known as a football school, um, but hopefully basketball is on the rise here. And I think you know, in my two years, well, not two years, five years, we've had two very very good seasons, very successful seasons. So two of the most successful seasons in, in school's history. Sweet. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah, it's a big things on the horizon, both for you, for the team. And, uh, you know, certainly an awesome, awesome way you came up and, you know, just meeting, meeting the right people, making the right connections, stepping up and saying the right thing to the, you know, the right people at the right time. It's like, yeah. it's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, a lot of it is dumb luck and a lot of it is just like, you know, we're, we're you know, these are positions where you really have to work and, you know, the work is kind of the, the expectation, but you do it and do it the right way and you meet the right people and suddenly, you know, you got, you got, uh, you know, a bunch of fire behind you. If there's one thing in the NBA or in the basketball community that people recognize it's, it's hard work, you know, no and, question. And Player, so, uh, coach, anybody, a, 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 anything you do, you do it, you know, you do it to the best of your ability and good things will happen. Well, very good. So you, uh, you collect cards. No question. That's, that's why we're here, right? Let, that's why we're here. That's why we're here. We're 35 minutes into this, <laughs> but it's like super fascinating. I, I mean, I think anyone that's watching this probably is fascinated by the basketball side of all this anyways, too, but let's, uh, let's talk about cards. Uh, did you did you bring some cards out to I have show a few. Yeah. yeah, I have a few. You know, like I like 99 percent of my stuff is currently sitting at PSA. And you know, during this whole COVID thing, I've just recently bought my first couple of slabs nice. uh, while I wait for the rest of these. So I'm a big believer of this guy, Luca. Never heard of him. Big fan, huge fan. Watched him at when he was at, you know, still playing for Real Madrid at 16 or 17 or whatever it was. So I, I had been talking about our our, our our coaching staff jokes about me and says that I don't like any American players because all I talk about is the foreigners. Yeah. So one of the things I love watching is international basketball. So I fell in love with this guy and I'd watch, you know, EuroLeague TV back when it was a thing, um, which was only a couple of years ago, but EuroLeague TV, I, you know, paid the monthly subscription just to watch Real Madrid games. Wow. So, um, so you didn't think he should have, uh, fallen to five. Well, when I, I can't remember, so who Phoenix got the number one pick that year, and I knew somebody who worked in their front office at the time, and my text to them was verbatim, "Congratulations, you just won the Luca lottery." <laughs> maybe if Luca had gone to AS or uh, University of Arizona, maybe they would have taken him. Ooh, you know, uh, you know, I'm sure they had whatever. You know, I think the DeAndre eight thing has worked out okay so far, and they had you know another cat named Devin Booker who's not bad. Okay. Um, who, by the way, we played against Devin Booker's team when I was at Florida, and he was he was unbelievable. He did a number on us. He made us change our whole game plan. Well, he was just one of those. He's just one of the you know when you have a dozen dozen five star recruits on the same team at the same time. It's like yeah, and it's hard crazy. So kind of hard to show everything that you have, and it's like Tyrese Maxey right now. He's he's really showing up the last couple games with the 76ers. Didn't do a whole ton with Kentucky last year, but it's like. And it kind of gives some of those dudes the benefit of the doubt because right. there's a lot of good Kentucky, former Kentucky guards throughout the league. And a lot no of them into a whole no time they they're in college. They've done a great job, whether it's uh, on their own or whether Kentucky helped them, whatever it is, it, there's something in the water there. Yeah, certainly. Um, big, so obviously big fan of Luca. The other two I, I really have gotten into are Ja and, and Jason Tatum. And, you know, I had a, chance to work with Jason at the through the USA stuff as well so I've gotten to know him a little bit too um big believer in him big believe you know saw him at 16 years old on the under 16 team and was like holy cow this is like the second coming of maybe Kobe Bryant yeah there's so there's in my mind those three players in particular there's like kind of a thread that connects them all at least in my impression but uh I want to see what you think. You know, what are you looking for in a in a card investment that you choose those guys? I mean, it's like okay, any anyone could be like Luca Tatum and Ja, really. You know, as far as the last four years of dudes, like sure, those are three of the best. But you know, I 
I think it's pretty telling that those are the three guys that you bought your first slabs of. Cause yeah, uh, I, I know. I, and you know, what's funny is like until you know, my, my buddy who may or may not be watching this, um, he's the one who got me in, back into this stuff. Like yeah. I, I, I had collected all throughout my childhood and then I stopped for a little while and then got back into it in about 2012, 13 thinking buy and flip was the move. But really I felt accidentally, I think I fell into like buy and hold. Yeah. To me, these are long-term guys because I think yeah. they're going to have unbelievable – these guys have, to me, Hall of Fame careers. Well, what I like about all three of those guys is it's like right away – I mean, sure, there's like the splash factor with all of them, you know, the, the Twitter highlight factor. But sure. they also all three of them are just immediately coming into the league just way, way more mature than a lot of their, you know, their peers around the same age. You sure. know, they they basketball IQ through the roof, just know what to do and make the right plays. Uh, offensively, you know, they get to the right spots. They take the right shots. And there's, there's so many guys out there that, that don't have any of those qualities, right. even, even further on down the league. So when you pulled up those three guys in particular, it's like, I really, I mean, I love all three of those guys too, but it's, it's that right from the jump, they know exactly what their role is and they know exactly what to, where to be. And, and also they, they're comfortable, you know, taking the reins of the team, you know, even when they're, they're young, you know, that's, that's cool. To me, it, it's, it's so cool to see, you know, Jason, Jason Tatum, the last time I saw him as a college player, we were playing them in the ACC tournament. Yeah. You know, shake, we, we had just taken a, another L to Duke and I was shaking his hand in the handshake line saying, good luck. Look forward to seeing you in the league next year. <laughs> and then, you know, a couple of years later, I'm in Boston watching them practice at training camp as, you know, have a, give him a quick dap after practice and say hello and ask him how he's doing. So it's like, you know, cool for me, it's cool to see like the evolution of some of these guys. Yep. Uh, I need to get on some of the other guys I've been around just from a loyalty standpoint. Like that's, that's who I am. Like I'll, I'll, I'll you know, probably buy cars of the guys I'm loyal to yep. or that I've been around like a miles Turner or Markel Fultz, but um, eventually at least, you know, once I get some of these other ones back, yep. Other, other guys that go after like Kobe, anything, Kobe, anything, Jordan, Yep. And, and uh, you know, I happened to fall into a, a Russell Wilson rookie by accident that I was trying to flip back in 12, 2012 before he had done anything with his career. Yeah. And uh, luckily, I hung on to it. Yeah. One of the tops RPA. So I'm, I'm really happy I hung on to it. Nice. Wisconsin difference right there. Hey, hey you, uh, it, you uh, so I'm sure you haven't been able to watch like a whole ton of this NBA season yet. No, so I've watched a good bit. Have you? I'm so, on league pass almost every single night. Any rookies that are you know kind of jumping off the page that you're thinking you might be targeting in the coming? I mentioned month? so I bought some of the Prism draft. So uh, uh, another staff member and I, we are kind of nerdy and we go looking at Walmart for whenever they have basketball. Now the Walmart here, not that there's a local basketball team or anything, but they never seem to have basketball. So the one time we yeah. found basketball, him and I, they had like six boxes of Prism draft picks. So he took three and I took three. Yeah, and uh, you know. Looking at it, we were big fan. He's we're both from Chicago, big you know Bulls fans. Yeah, Pat Williams was yeah. one that we we were like really excited that we both got Prism cards of. Yeah. Uh, the other one was for me. The other one I was really I was thrilled about was the Lamella Lamel Ball one. I didn't think I didn't think he was gonna amount. I didn't think he'd have his, this much early success, but I knew he had a lot of popularity behind him. Right. And I'm you know like I said earlier in the pod or in, in the chat. Very impressive. Yep. Very impressive. Top rebounding rookie, rookie, uh, I think, at the moment. So good for him. Yep. No, if if it was if we were doing the draft again, I'm pretty sure he'd probably go number one. But pa but Patrick Williams. You can, you, I mean, uh, you can make an argument. I, I'm I'm trying to remember Peyton Pritchard, another one who who. Uh, gosh, I wish I had this photo from Hoop Summit here because in that photo is like Jason Tatum and Peyton Pritchard and. Jared Allen, all these, all these guys who are doing well in the league right now. It's it, you know Peyton Pritchard was very impressive. Yeah, he, he hit the game winner the other day against Miami when I watched him. So I was like really happy for him. Yeah, it's nice to see a guy like that that really not on mo a lot of people's radars. Right. And all of a sudden, he's like Boston's favorite son. All, all and, and him being a West Coast, you know, out here on the East, those those West Coast games are happening after nine o'clock at night. Most of us are that's usually past most of our bedtimes. Yeah. So we're not watching a lot of Pac-12 ball at you know nine or ten o'clock at night, but right. you know Peyton Pritchard in, in the basketball community, people know who Peyton Pritchard is. But out here, people don't on the East Coast, people don't know Peyton Pritchard because he played really far away. 
Right. No, um, yeah. I, yeah, I, I, think that has, I think that has something to do with it. Like geography, where you play, what yeah. your, you know, what your, what your come up is. Yep. Stuff like that. Um, I'm trying to think of other rookies that have really jumped off the charts at me. Um, you know, Anthony Edwards kind of knew he was going into a situation where he was set up, I think, to, to do pretty well. So it's not surprising that he's doing well. Yeah. Um, James Wiseman is in a situation where he's starting as a rookie center with Steph Curry. He's going to do well. I think it's just a matter of time before they're they're dangerous again. Yep, I agree. And he'll be a part of that. So I'm I'm looking forward to this rookie class. Looking forward to you know some of the other guys who are still young and on their first contract and and seeing what happens here. Yep. So you you mentioned there's another coach on the staff collecting with you. Is this like a is this a widespread disease the card collecting that you know you got I, a lot of people. I don't, know how, I don't know how wide it is among other coaching staffs, but like there's for sure three of us on our staff that collect and like you know he's he's got a massive maybe the biggest magic johnson collection i've ever seen oh, he's sweet. a big Mich big michigan state person so he's like magic johnson like he showed me like pictures and pictures of all these you know uh jersey swatch patch autos of magic johnson i was like man this is impressive it's like three or four hundred cards deep wow um and then our sports info director who another chicago guy that i was mentioning earlier yeah, he uh, he's like personal. He has PCs of like anything Blackhawks, hockey, uh, anything Chicago Bulls. Yeah, and then his baseball and football teams are St. Louis based, so like Rams and um and the and the Cardinals. So big big collector on on that stuff. And and you know, um you know our the guy who uh, I just mentioned previously with the Magic Johnson collection also a Pokemon guy. Oh yeah. So Pokemon is the other stuff I collect, which you know those things are also sitting in PSA's queue. So maybe I'll get them back next year. Go follow uh, Pocket Stocks on uh, Instagram. That's all, 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 all already done. All right, sweet. Already done. Yeah, you know I think uh, all of us that you know, particularly in like basketball investing or whatever it is, or basketball collecting, baseball, whatever, we all do it because when we were kids, you know, exactly, we were really into it, and. Exactly. Uh, and I'm sure it's like, I don't know, people, sometimes people badmouth the investment side of this as if it hasn't always kind of been about that in a lot of ways. And it's like, I mean, I don't think I was the only person in the world going to the library and renting the Beckett price guides and going through and figuring out which of my cards were worth over a dollar. It's like, if it was over a dollar, I'd take a little sticker, I'd put it on there, I'd write the Beckett price amount on there. It's like, of course, back then, you couldn't actually sell any any of the crap. It was right. just like my plan was to just I still have it somewhere around here. Uh, you know, a whole sleeve of cards that are worth like anywhere between five and fifteen dollars, and uh, pretty much all junk. But uh, my plan was give it to my kids someday, and that they'll be rich off of it. Uh, I think we all pretty much had probably had a pretty similar trajectory through, and you, there came a point where it's like, what's the point of this? Well, now all of a sudden it's super easy to sell, and so. It's like anyone who's in who's been involved in sports or loved sports or is currently involved in sports. It's like we're all just buying cards because that's what we like to do. We it's, like it's hilarious, man. We like to be a part of it. We like to try and figure out who's going to be good. We 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 like guys that we just like and you know PC them and stuff. And so it, you know it's not a surprise to hear that there's college coaching staffs that are collecting. I'm sure there's. I'm sure it's picking up. A, in the NBA circles with players. It's hilarious when you, you saw the other day when Luca was asked about his card values and stuff like that. And he said, I need some or so or whatever. And LeBron, somebody posts one on, on Instagram about LeBron. He says, I think I have a few of these or whatever. Like it's, it's, it's hilarious. Yeah. You know, my wife looks at me like I'm crazy and thinks I sound crazy, but then I show her a tweet of like Darren Rovell saying this Mickey Mantle card today just sold for $5 million. And it's like, yeah. I know. And, th and that's exactly how they look at you. Yep. That's why, you know, people talk about this being like a bubble right now. And I mean, I think any any investment market or pretty much any market is technically a, a bubble, I believe. But it's like the difference is we, ha you know, sports, you know, sports fandom is one of the biggest markets in the entire world. So many of us grew up buying and sell, you know, buying cards. Now right. we have the ability to sell it and everyone's just coming back in and there's still so many untapped markets for it. And now you're getting players involved. And once they're starting tweeting about it and showing their collections and stuff, you know, it, it just builds on it. I think we're going to be getting two new NBA teams in a, in a year or two. And there's going to be a lot of excitement around two new markets there and whatever players end up there. It's like, you know, there's just so much more 
buildup on the horizon, maybe not like the last nine months of COVID, you know, that rapid, rapid incline in, in the market overall. But, you know, it's there's still just like there's untapped potential in, in the market overall. And so I, you know, I, I don't see this going away. It's like we have all the tools at our disposal now to continue buying, buying smartly. You know, don't have to only go to your support your local card shops, but you're not limited. Right. To you're not depending on ripping a pack open shop. to get the one of one logo man or whatever. Right. 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 It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's, yeah. it's it, like to me, and I had no idea the bubble, this bubble was happening or this rapid ascension was happening. My friend put me onto it. And then when I went home for a week in August to, to go visit the family for a little bit, I looked through my drawers and I was like, I still have all these cards. Yeah. I just, I just fell on something that I never even realized was worth something. Yep. And I just hung on to it because I, I couldn't get rid of it at the time. Yep. Like base rookies of Anthony Davis and stuff like that. I was like, huh, who knew? Yeah, I found some base rookies of uh, Dwight Howard. There you go. A couple, which I think the time came and went for me to sell those. But, uh, you know, I was like, huh, I had no idea that I, you know, I broke that. Like, I couldn't believe it. Like, I, I, you know, my friend would tell me like, oh, yeah, get so-and-so's rookie card. I said, what's this obsession with rookie cards? And then I look and I said, oh, okay, you know what? Fair enough. Yep. And I went home and I, you know, I had my mom look through like five or six boxes of cards and she's like, Okay, I found like 30 rookies of so-and-so and 10 more of this person. 10 more. Here's a here's a 200 collection of Kobe cards from this anthology set. I'm like, yes. Yeah, that's a good find right there. Now, uh, moving, moving on, you're a coach. You study film. Have you ever seen more than one ball on the court at the same time? Not yet. <laughs> So what are the Nets going to do? <laughs> so it's Thursday. We're recording this Thursday. So that means yesterday the big trade just went down. I wanted to get your thoughts on, on the James Harden to the Nets. You've already mentioned Steve Nash, Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant, uh, uh, Jared Allen. So you've already mentioned like all the Nets. So we've, we've led here. I wish Actually, I could. Hey, I, I have a hilarious picture of. Can I pause you for a second? Yeah, go for it. I'm sorry. I I got a guy that's called me like six times. I really got to answer this. I'm sorry. No problem. Go for All it. Right. I'll, I'll be right back. So Brooklyn Nets. Sorry for the interruption. Brooklyn yeah. Nets. Uh, how do you see this shaking out? So, in my opinion, James Harden is one of the most unique basketball players that's ever existed, and you know, obviously, he's got previous chemistry with KD. This is gonna be this is gonna be good for him. They got just enough role players around him, just enough pieces and bench depth. Like Joe Harris isn't a slouch; he's really good. Yeah. He's turned into an unbelievable, way better than, than I would have ever expected an NBA player. DeAndre yeah. Jordan still got something left in the tank, I think. And uh, you know they've got enough, you know, still there. TLC is solid in his role. Nick Clax, Chris, Chio, Chris Chioza, who I coached as a freshman at Florida, uh, nice. very solid. Uh, Nick claxton has been a point forward or point center, however they they want to play him. So they they got some pieces there. And, uh, you know, you probably just need enough from those guys to, to get, you know, on a given night, you can, you can, you know what you're going to get from those three guys. And then you get enough bench scoring or, you know, Harris continues knocking down threes. DeAndre Jordan plays defense, rebounds, runs the floor. You got yourself a good team there. Yeah. I thought you didn't have one before because I thought Karis, I was, you know, obviously it's James Harden. You do whatever you can to get him. Uh, but Karis LeVert's a budding star too. Yeah. Jared yeah, Allen's good, a budding star. Up for Indiana there. No question. Just, Nice, nice for them to get involved because yep. I don't think Oladipo is going to be staying in Indiana, and that they rope in Karis Levert for their troubles. It's like, Karis Levert is a great player now that he's healthy again. Yeah, uh, you know he had issues in college where he couldn't stay on the floor, so I'm glad to see he's healthy. Uh, yep. But you know, really, look, whenever whenever we can see all three of those guys play together, I'm looking forward to it. I know I'll be on. I, I know whether it's on you know nationally televised or league pass only, I'll be watching. Yep. Well, de I mean, definitely. You know, the basketball side is going to be fun. Yeah. I don't know that I would want to be hanging out in the locker room, but that's another question. What, what, ha what happens outside the lines, I can't really say a whole lot about. <laughs> right. So, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, it, I'm on paper, it's like at the end of the game, you have three dudes that could get it done. Yep. And really, a lot of games come down to the end of the game. So, you know, we'll see what happens there. Look at um, it. All right. I think that's all the, the questions I have for you today. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me on, man. And, uh, you know, any, any anytime you need some questions answered, I got you. Sweet. I appreciate it. It's good yeah. to have a video coordinator that I can call on because 
there's a lot of stuff I don't know. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Amit. Yep. Uh, you can follow him on Instagram. Donut, like donut. Donut have a problem. Uh, he'll be posting donuts every now and then, and and uh, may, hopefully once he starts getting cards back from PSA, he'll be posting some. Uh, some be on PSA. the lookout. But be on, be, definitely be on the lookout. Some stuff is, hopefully comes back and it comes back soon. <laughs> all right. Excellent. Well, thank you all for watching. Uh, we'll see you again next week. Thanks, Sandy. Right. See you. Bye.